One of the things our culture lacks is a serious rite of passage. One time we can go off, be by yourself, delve down inside, and start sorting out the things you learned as a child on your way to adulthood, trying to see which things you're going to carry into adulthood and which things you're going to leave behind. It's almost as if, as if our culture is afraid to have people do that for fear of what they might see. Our minds are so connected now through the media. And there's a strong sense that if you're not participating in the, the general culture, there's something wrong with you. You have very little room for dissent, very little room for real independence. But meditation is, is one activity that you can do that gives you some of that freedom, gives you some of that time to yourself. In a lot of cultures, they want you to go out and have a vision quest and gain a vision that may be of your totem animal or some symbol that the culture recognizes. The Buddha's rite of passage was a lot more radical than that called everything into question. In particular, it came to find an answer to the question that deals very deeply with our relationship to society around us. To what extent does your personal happiness have to make way for the needs of society? To what extent is it really detrimental to society for people to go off and find happiness in their own ways. And to what extent does your personal happiness have to be in conflict with others? The Buddha found that it is possible to find a happiness that doesn't harm anybody. The fact that he gained awakening never harmed anybody. We came back to teach. A lot of his teachings were not pleasing to some people. We're not willing to change their ideas. So it's not the case that he came up with an answer that was going to please everybody. But he came up with an answer that wasn't going to harm anybody. And at the same time, brought him a happiness that was the ultimate happiness. So we look at his example and said, he can do it. Why can't we? This is what we're doing as we meditate, is giving the mind a place where it can set itself apart not only from people outside, that's called physical seclusion, but also mental seclusion, the people inside your mind. Because we have all these different voices in our mind that we've picked up from people, our parents, our teachers, our friends, the media. And it's a real jumble. And it's good to have some time away, physically, so you can get off by yourself, and then mentally. Give yourself a place to stay in mind so that you can step out of the thoughts, skip, step out of the voices. This is one of the reasons why we work with the breath. It's the closest thing to the mind that is not a thought. With the various elements or properties of the body, the breath is the one that is most immediately present to your awareness. We tend to think of the body as being a solid lump that we're aware of, and then the breath is something we have to pull in. But actually, breath is what lets you know that there's solidity there to begin with. So it's right there next to the mind. It gives you a place where you can stand a little bit outside of the mind, outside of your thoughts, and yet be close enough to, so you can watch them. That's part of the rite of passage, is giving you this place. So explore your breath. Learn to see what kind of breathing feels good, what kind of breathing doesn't feel good, what ways of picturing the breath to yourself are helpful and which ways are not. How you can breathe in a way that really is blissful. One of the tricks is making sure that you don't squeeze the end of the breath in or the end of the breath out. 
Trying to think of the in-breath flowing into the out-breath, the out-breath flowing back into the in-breath. In other words, let the breath do the breathing. You don't have to use the solid parts of the body to do the breathing. Or even worse, you don't have to do the let the pains do the breathing when you're aware of the pains in the body and not much else. Then as you breathe in, it feels like the painful areas are the ones that have to do the work. So think of breath as being an energy cocoon that's in the body and a little bit outside the body as well. Its boundaries are not all that clearly defined. And the quality of this cocoon is that it breathes in, breathes out, expands, contracts. But it's all one cocoon. Try to hold that perception in mind and see if it helps you settle down. And at the very least, it helps you get into it, the kind of concentration the Buddha taught, which is to have a full body awareness. And if you can see with the breath as simply being air coming in and out through the nose, it's hard to relate that to the whole body. And if you do, you have to think of other things in the body. But if you realize that breath is an energy flow, it's a property of the wind property, or an aspect of the wind property. And it's everywhere in the body. So let the breath do the breathing. And you can nudge it to make it longer, shorter, deeper, more shallow. Whatever feels good for the body right now, whatever the body needs. And try to do this in a way that you feel like you're settling in. Because one of the important aspects of getting the mind in right concentration is you give it a place where you can stay for long periods of time and not feel that it has to move. We're not here to jump through jhana hoops where we have to say, spend seven minutes here, seven minutes there. You stay right here. Now your relationship to the breath will develop as you stay right here. Your relationship to the feelings that come with the breath, feelings of ease, feelings of fullness or refreshment. As long as they feel refreshing, stay with them. When they begin to seem a little bit too much, then you think of a more subtle level of energy in the body, a more subtle level of breath. It's there. Just focus in on that and let the movements of the the rapture, the refreshment, whatever. Let them take care of themselves. Now thoughts will come up as you're doing this. And in the beginning, all you have to do is just tell yourself they're not part of this process right now. They're not relevant to what you're doing. Sometimes they'll be really insistent and you have to think a little bit about them, but try to think about them in ways that can untangle you from them as quickly as possible. Remind yourself you're trying to get in touch with a level of awareness that really doesn't have a history. It doesn't have stories. We have our stories about what happened to us when we were young, what may have happened to us before we were born. But there's an aspect of awareness that doesn't have those stories, doesn't have to carry them around. Try to get in touch with that aspect of your awareness. Anything that comes up that reminds you of who you are or what has happened in your life, you say, this is not relevant right now. Try to find something timeless. Let that be the thought that helps to extricate you. Or if that one doesn't work, you'll find that there are other ways of thinking about what's happened to you in the past, in terms of karma, thinking about the vast expanses of time during which karma has gone back and forth, back and forth. Whatever helps give you a perspective on your thoughts that allows you to put them aside, so you can settle in here and have a real sense of feeling at home. And then when you can stay here, then you get the second step in the rite of passage, which is to allow some of those thoughts back in. But now they're in your territory. You're not wandering out into their territory, and that's what makes all the difference. There's an image in the canon of monkeys wandering out of their territory and getting to areas where 
hunters have laid traps, and they get caught by the traps, carried off. Whereas if they stay in their own territory, they're safe. The areas where the hunters can't go. And if you're thinking of yourself out in the world, or thinking of yourself in terms of your identity that the world has given you, and that you've adopted as you've been participating in the world, in terms of the pleasures you get from the world, okay, that's going to be the territory where the hunters can get you. But if you have this sense of belonging here, in the present moment, with your awareness filling the body, your sense of the breath energy filling the body, your sense of ease filling the body. This is your territory. And now when thoughts come in here, they're here on your terms. And John Cha has a nice image. He says it's as if you have a house where there's one chair. And as long as you're in the house and you're sitting in the chair, whoever else comes into the house has to stand. And they're subject to your orders as to what they have to do. Now, if you leave the chair and leave the house, okay, they can get you. You're in their territory. But if you can look at the thoughts that come in in your territory, then you can ask yourself, okay, where does this thought lead? Does this lead to my true happiness or does it lead away? And remind yourself that true happiness is going to be harmless. It's not a selfish thing. It comes from developing your internal resources in a way where you become more generous, more virtuous, wiser. It's all to the good. And then you can start questioning all the other voices that pull in another direction and say, what do they know? For me, that was one of the big turnarounds in my practice. I think went over to Thailand. I was practicing meditation, and it was during the Vietnam War. And you could hear the bombers going overhead at 3 a.m. in the morning. They were on their way to bomb in Vietnam. I kept thinking, here I am just focusing on my own breath, being very selfish. And the, all the voices that I began to identify, okay, that was the voice of my mother, that was the voice of my father, the ideas that were telling me that I shouldn't be doing this. And I had to realize, what do they know of this? This is an area that they haven't gone to. And don't think it's just for people who are raised in countries that are not Buddhist. And John Fung had a lot of students who were getting a lot of flack from their parents for practicing. It's okay to you know, go to the monastery, go to the temples, make merit. But if you're actually meditating on that, you're getting out a little bit of, out of their control. They didn't like it. So he had to teach his Thai students, okay, you've got to ask yourself, what do they know? The fact that you're finding a happiness that they don't understand, that bothers them. It doesn't fit into their worldview. And so you have to ask yourself, are you going to let yourself be a prisoner of their worldview, or are you going to get out? And if getting out meant that you were going to be ungrateful, ungenerous, well, that would be a bad thing, but this is not the case. At the same time, I was sorting through the thoughts that I was getting from my parents, and John Fuang kept reminding me, got to have gratitude for what they have done, the good things they have done for you. So it's not just a simple rebellion where you have been taught A all your life, and now you're going to say, well, I'm going to hold on to it, not A. There are lots of different things that you have to sort out. But again, the mind and the concentration gives you a place where you can do the sorting. And you can do it with full alertness, full awareness. And as you keep doing it, your discernment is going to grow as well. You remind yourself that you're motivated by compassion, both for yourself and for others. And happy that you found a path that allows you to find your true happiness without having to harm anybody. A lot of Western psychology is built on the idea that you've got your desire for happiness, and it's pretty wild and untamable. And then you've got the structures of society which tell you what you've got to do, and they have very little to do with your true happiness. A lot of them have to do with what society thinks is its, in its own best interest. And you're caught between those two impulses, 
Whereas the Buddha says, no, he's got a different set of shoulds that really are for your true happiness. And so even though your desires for happiness may be uncontrollable in some areas, they've got the basic idea right. Well, happiness is a good thing. But if you, then the next idea is, well, how do you find it in such a way that you're going to have a true happiness? Happiness is not going to change. Well, that's when you have to learn how to be a little bit wiser, more compassionate, more alert to your actions and the results of your actions. So what you, act, what you actually do and say and think is in line with your ideals. That's the quality that the Buddha calls purity. So wisdom, compassion, purity. These are the qualities of the Buddha. These are the qualities that come from practicing this rite of passage. Then it's not a rite of passage where all bets are off and anything can happen. There is a direction to this. It's not like we're just getting into the present moment and saying, well, wherever the present moment is going to lead me, that's fine. And we're doing this because we have a very clear idea of what we want. True happiness, harmless happiness. And that idea will get even clearer as we finally discover it is possible and we're able to do it. So the choice is yours if you want to take on this goal, but it's a really good one. I can't think of anything in the world that would be better. <laughs>